Uh, good morning and welcome everyone. It's great to be back aboard Carl Vinson. Our last time together was during TESTA and the very successful MB-22 Osprey feedback experiment. Kev Rissimo, thanks to you and your team for the setup and the hospitality, hospitality today. The ship looks great. This morning it's my privilege to introduce our Secretary of Defense. He re recently visited John C. Stennis and Air Wing 9 while they were up on patrol in the 7th Fleet AOR, a place where Carl Vinson Strike Group may soon be operating. And although I'm sure there are some of you who would rather pe press on to the fight in the 5th Fleet, I can assure you that your presence in the Western Pacific, the Indo-Asia Pacific, is critically vital to the security and stability of that important region of the world. And I think SecDef will reinforce the significance of your upcoming deployment. SecDef has spent more than three decades leveraging his knowledge of science and technology, global strategy and policy, as well as his deep dedication to the men and women of the armed forces to make our nation and the world a safer place. He is our biggest advocate for improving and sustaining readiness across the force, for ensuring you have the best equipment and the latest technologies, and for advancing programs that enhance your quality of service in the lives of our military families. And it's an honor to have him with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm Carl Vinson welcome for our 25th Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter. Uh, good morning, gang. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me start by saying how great it is to be in San Diego, and I appreciate that this has been a, this beautiful city here has been a community that's been welcoming to our military for many years. We don't take it for granted. We're very grateful to you. Thank you. And uh, where'd Mike go? There we are. Oh no! Please sit down. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. One of the many ways Mike has given me help over a long time we've known each other. Appreciate it. Uh, you all are lucky. Uh, to have Mike in command out here. Um, he, uh, uh, Secretary of Defense isn't a bad title, but Air Boss is a great title, and he does a very good job of it. Uh, also, Doug Verissimo, Doug V8, your captain. Uh, but I am here to talk to all of you, all of you, the sailors of the Carl Vinson. And first of all, to thank you for everything you do every day, and then to say something about the strategic meaning of what you're accomplishing for our nation and our world here. For over three decades, the men and women of the Gold Eagle have done what is the noblest thing a person, each and every one of you, can do with your lives, which is to defend our great country and make a better world for our children. And today, you and what is the rest of what is the finest fighting force the world has ever known, America's, are addressing squarely the five major rapidly evolving challenges that we face in our security. First, we're countering the prospect of Russian aggression and coercion, especially in Europe. We're managing historic change in the Asia Pacific. More on that in a moment. Where China's rising, which is fine, but sometimes behaving aggressively, which is not. Indeed, we're also strengthening our deterrent and defense forces in the face of North Korea's continued missile and nuclear provocations. We're checking Iranian aggression and malign influence in the Gulf and protecting our friends and allies in the Middle East. And every day, and as we sit here right now, we're accelerating the certain defeat of ISIL, destroying the fact and the idea that there can be a state based upon this evil 
ideology. First in its parent tumor in Iraq and Syria, and everywhere it metastasizes around the world, even as we help, continue to help, to protect our people here at home. Now today I want to speak with you about our strategy with respect to what is the single most consequential region for America's future, which is the Asia Pacific. And I want to echo what the Air Boss said a moment ago, which is what we all believe. Your mission here is critically important to our country, to our security, and to that of our friends and allies. I spent the last couple of days with some of the thousands of men and women, military and civilian, who contribute to our nuclear deterrence mission. Now, I'll tell you the same thing I told them. Even if your mission, whether it's at a missile silo in North Dakota or an aircraft carrier in what is today the relatively peaceful Asia Pacific, even if that's not in the headlines every day, as I see it, we're in real trouble when what you do gets in the headlines. Your mission here is one of fundamental strategic importance to our country. And that it's not in the headlines is a tribute to your success. We need to keep it that way. Remember, this region with half of humanity, half of the world's economy is the single most consequential one for America's future, and indeed for the world's. The rebalance to the Asia Pacific, which President Obama announced five years ago, is a critical national commitment. It includes diplomatic, economic, and military components, all to ensure that at a time of dramatic political, economic, and security change in the region, that the Asia-Pacific remains a place where every nation can rise and prosper. To do that, as all of you know, nations are going to need security. People can't have all the other things that make life meaningful if they're not safe. That's essential for the Asia-Pacific's continued progress, and that's our charge and your charge. DOD's component of the rebalance, the work you and your fellow American service member carry out, out here with strength, with with principle, will help this dynamic region realize its potential in that principled future. The good news is we don't have to do this alone. We're strong. But we also have many friends and partners and allies in the region, part of a burgeoning network, a principled and inclusive network in the Asia-Pacific region. This afternoon, I'm flying on to Hawaii to meet with 10 of those partners, my counterparts from the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, to discuss how we're partnering together in new ways to ensure security and stability in that vital corner of the vast Asia Pacific. So before I depart, I want to remind you who are at the center of everything out here and at the center of all of our minds back in Washington about all that DOD is doing to operationalize the rebalance, to ensure that we have the people, the payloads, the platforms, the war plans, and the partners to continue bolstering security in this region for decades to come. And I also want to share with you the first steps we'll be taking, that you'll be taking, in the next phase, the next phase of the rebalance, our third, to catalyze the Asia-Pacific's principled and inclusive security network and ensure the Asia-Pacific remains a region where every nation can rise and prosper. That's been America's objective and America's practice since World War II. In fact, tomorrow I'll host the Southeast Asian Defense Ministers aboard the USS Missouri. The Mighty Mo, as it's called, most famous for being the site 71 years ago this month of the signing ceremony that ended World War II. At the end of that session, General Douglas MacArthur, who presided over the ceremony, said, let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. With that prayer, and in the decades since, Millions of American men and women serving in uniform across the Asia Pacific have helped restore the region and preserve its stability. Every port call and every flight hour, 
Every exercise and operation, and every soldier, sailor, airman, and Marine has made important contributions to the Asia Pacific security. Those Americans, including all of you, have also helped uphold and defend important principles, like resolving disputes peacefully, ensuring countries can make choices free from external coercion and intimidation, and preserving the freedom of overflight and navigation guaranteed by international law. And we've seen how U.S.-enabled security and these principles have helped countries throughout the region make incredible progress. Think about it. First Japan, then Taiwan, then South Korea, then Southeast Asia rose and prospered. And today, China and India do the same. That progress has produced incredible changes in the region. Populations are growing, education has improved, freedom and self-determination have taken hold, economies are becoming more interconnected, and military spending is increasing. Amid all this remarkable change and progress, America's objectives in the Asia-Pacific have endured since that day on the Missouri. We still want peace, stability, and progress in the Asia-Pacific. But as the region has changed, our approach has had to change along with it. That's why five years ago, President Obama announced in Australia that the United States was going to launch the rebalance to, to quote him, play a larger and long-term role in shaping this region and its future. That last word, future, is important. The rebalance is about the future. With it, we're not trying to stop or rewind the clock in the Asia Pacific. For we know that in the decades after World War II, amid the region's ruins and unhealed wounds dating back to that war and even to the decades before that, not every nation got the opportunity to fully realize its potential. That legacy, along with the region's many internal rifts and historical tensions, with which you're very familiar, must be overcome. And the great nations and peoples of the Asia Pacific must be able to realize their full potential. That rebalance is an investment in the region's future. It will help unlock the Asia Pacific's tremendous promise and build a brighter future. And that's good for the United States. For example, the United States wants to reinforce the open and inclusive economic approach that we all know can continue to benefit the region. That's why one of the most important non-military initiatives of the rebalance is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, which will bind the United States more closely together with 11 other economies, guarantee a high trade, a high quality, high standard trade system, and support more U.S. exports and higher paying American jobs. For those reasons and its strategic value, TPP is an opportunity the region and the United States cannot afford to miss. Unfortunately, challenges always accompany opportunities in times of change, and today in the Asia-Pacific there are a number of security challenges, including North Korea, which, with its nuclear saber rattling, continues to threaten our allies and heighten tensions in the region. There are also challenges to the shared principles we've long upheld. For example, maritime concerns in the East and South China Sea, in the Indian Ocean, and elsewhere pose a risk to the region's prosperous future. Terrorism and other transnational threats spare no region of the globe. As we support these principles, the United States will continue to stand with our allies and partners, and we will, as we have demonstrated and as we will continue to demonstrate, fly, sail, and operate wherever international law allows. And with the military component of the rebalance, the United States will help the region to meet these challenges and to remain the primary mainstay of security in the Asia Pacific. The men and women of the Defense Department, including all of you, have pursued each phase of the rebalance with strength, commitment, and inclusion. In the first phase, beginning five years ago, DOD quantitatively and geographically enhanced the U.S. military force posture in this vast region. After years of emphasis on counterterrorism and wars in the Middle East, which we needed to pay attention to, 
And in light of the regional changes since the end of the Cold War, we made a choice to strengthen our posture in the Asia Pacific, to make it more robust as well as more geographically distributed, more operationally resilient, and politically sustainable in the region. That's why DOD sent tens of thousands of additional American personnel to the region. That's why we committed to home porting 60 percent of our naval and overseas air assets in the Asia Pacific by 2020. That's why we began to modernize our footprint in Japan and in the Republic of Korea. And that's why we began to realign our Marines from a highly centralized presence in Okinawa, Japan, to additional locations in Australia, Hawaii, and Guam, the latter serving as a strategic hub. In the second phase of the rebalance, which we launched last year, we've made qualitative improvements to our force posture, upgrading our own military capabilities, while at the same time also modernizing and advancing our defense relationships to reflect regional change and new opportunities. The second phase is force posture improvements, including sending our best people, including sailors like you, and assigning our most advanced capabilities to the Asia Pacific including the F-22 and F-35 stealth fighter jets, P-8 Poseidon maritime patrol aircraft, continuous deployments of strategic bombers, and our newest surf surface warfare vessels, including all of our newest stealth destroyers, the DDG-1000. We also continued making strategic and substantial investments in new capabilities critical to the rebalance like not only growing the overall number of surface ships, but also making, e making each of them much more lethal. And investing more in Virginia-class submarines and in areas like cyber. And we develop new and innovative strategies and operational concepts, which we put to use in more complex and expansive training exercises, both on our own and with our allies and partners, none larger than this summer's REMPAC. Also in the second phase, we sought to modernize America's relationships with militaries across the region. These are ties that have been nurtured over decades, tested in crisis, and built on shared interests, values, and sacrifice. But they all need, also need to evolve to reflect growing capabilities, new national aspirations, and changing security needs. You can see the breadth and depth of this modernization, starting with our allies, the U.S.-Japan alliance, to begin with remains the cornerstone of Asia-Pacific security. And with our new defense guidelines, the U.S.-Japan alliance has never been stronger or more capable of contributing to security in the region and beyond. Our alliance with the Republic of Korea also continues to evolve to assure deterrence on the Korean Peninsula, including through the joint decision earlier this year to deploy the THAAD ballistic missile defense system to the Republic of Korea to help defend against North Korean threats there. Alliance is more and more a global one. As our two nations partner together across the Asia Pacific, we're also together accelerating the defeat of ISIL in Iraq and Syria. Our longstanding alliance with Thailand goes back to the 19th century, continues to benefit both countries and contribute to regional security. And as it has been for decades, our alliance with the Philippines is ironclad. And through the Landmark Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, or EDCA, the United States is supporting the modernization of the Philippine Armed Forces. Next, America's regional partnerships are growing in number and strength. The U.S.-India military relationship is the closest it's ever been. Great nation, large democracy, through our strategic handshake with America's reaching west in our rebalance and India reaching east in what Prime Minister Modi calls his Act East policy, our two nations are exercising together by air, land, and sea. Never did that before. And there's also a technological handshake between the United States and India. The U.S.-India Defense Technology and Trade Initiative grasps hands with Prime Minister Modi's Make in India campaign helping our countries move toward more diverse defense co-development and co-production of weapon systems. 
Meanwhile, the U.S.-Singapore relationship continues to grow with Singapore hosting of American littoral combat ships and P-8 maritime patrol aircraft. The U.S.-Vietnam partnership has also been dramatically strengthened. The United States lifted the ban on lethal weapon sales to Vietnam recently to provide Vietnam greater access to the military equipment it needs and wants. And in fact, today, as we speak right here, the USS John McCain, named after Senator John McCain, Chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, is visiting Vietnam. And I spoke with Senator McCain yesterday about the historical significance of this visit. And notably, the American and New Zealand militaries have taken an important step forward. As later this fall, the U.S. Navy, a U.S. Navy destroyer will make the first American port call in New Zealand in 30 years. And in the second phase, we also started to connect and network these allies and partners together. A good example of that is the Maritime Security Initiative, which we launched last year. It represents an initial $425 million five-year American commitment to enable regional maritime security network in Southeast Asia. More than simply providing hardware, this initiative helps the United States enable the Philippines Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand to connect and to work with one another and us so that they can all see more, share more, and do more to ensure maritime security throughout the vital waters of Southeast Asia. Now, given our inclusive approach, DOD is also taking steps to modernize our military to military relationship with China. In recent years, we've strengthened communications between our two militaries and reduced the risk of miscalculations that could lead to crises. We've recently concluded two confidence-building measures, one on maritime rules of behavior and another on crisis communications. We also regularly participate together in multilateral exercises such as RIMPAC that demonstrate the value of working together to address security issues. And our two militaries also hold regular dialogues and high-level consultations that seek to minimize misunderstanding. Now, the United States still has serious concerns with Ch some of China's recent actions on the seas, in cyberspace, and elsewhere. Beijing sometimes appears to want to pick and choose which principles it wants to benefit from and which it prefers to try to undercut. For example, the universal right to freedom of navigation that allows China's ships and aircraft to transit safely and peacefully is the same right that Beijing criticizes other countries for exercising in the region. The principles are not like that. They, they apply to everyone and every nation equally. As President Obama has said, the U.S.-China relationship will have elements of cooperation but also competition. We hope that China chooses to join the rest of the region in strengthening and upholding the shared principles that have helped so many nations around the region, including China, to rise and to prosper. Now, in the third phase of the rebalance, we're going to cement the progress we've made in the first and second phases and build upon it, first by continuing to qualitatively upgrade and invest in our regional force posture with sustained strategic investments I'll describe in a moment and second by catalyzing the Asia Pacific's principled and inclusive security network even more in this next phase the United States will continue to sharpen our military edge so we remain the most powerful military in the region and the security partner of choice we're already sending our best people and platforms into the region and in the rebalance's third phase, we'll increase and target investments to ensure, that they, to ensure that they and all of you stay the best. Here are some of the path-breaking and high-tech improvements we're making beginning in this budget this year. We're going to make more of our Virginia-class submarines more lethal and more capable by tripling their Tomahawk cruise missile strike capability with the Virginia payload module. We're increasing funding for undersea drones multiple sizes and diverse payloads.
that can operate more effectively in shallow waters where manned subs cannot. These are part of more than $40 billion we're investing over the next five years to ensure we continue to have the most lethal undersea and anti-submarine warfare force in the world. We're ensuring our continued air superiority and global reach, including with over $12 billion over the next five years for the new B-21 radar, radar long-range strike bomber. We're investing more than $56 billion over the next five years to buy, during this period alone, more than 500 of the stealthy fifth-generation F-35 Joint Strike Fighters, including more for the Navy and more for the Marine Corps, while also improving avionics, radar, and electronic warfare systems on legacy bomber and fighter aircraft. We're upgrading our aerial tanker fleet investing almost $16 billion over the next five years in the KC-46A Pegasus tanker to help shrink the Asia-Pacific's vast distances. We're repurposing the SM-6 missile so that it can also strike enemy ships at sea at very long ranges. We're investing in other advanced munitions to improve range and accuracy for land attack and any ship missiles, some new torpedoes, as well as some very creative and, we're sure, unexpected by potential foes ways to use such missiles across the varied domains of the Asia-Pacific. And we're also making large new investments in cyber, in electronic warfare, and in space capabilities, a total of $34 billion just next year. And we're going to have a few more surprises as well. These leap ahead investments will keep us ahead in the Asia Pacific and elsewhere. Now, I can't share all the details on these for obvious reasons, but what our friends and our potential adversaries and all of you should know is that these new capabilities will help keep us our decades old commitment to undergirding security in the Asia Pacific strong and unchallengeable. These advances may change how we operate they will, but will never change why we do so, for the security of our people, for our friends and allies, and for the principles that have benefited so many in the region for so long. Now as we make these investments in our military edge, we'll also catalyze the Asia Pacific's growing, principled and inclusive security network. Unlike elsewhere in the world, and think about this. Peace and stability in the Asia Pacific has never been managed by some region wide formal structure like NATO has, is in Europe. And that's because the Asia Pacific is so different. It's got a unique history, geography, and politics, and accordingly, bilateral relationships, one country to another, have instead long been the mainstay of military cooperation in this region. And yet, as the Asia-Pacific continues to change, as it faces opportunities and challenges, and as it becomes more interconnected politically and economically, the region's militaries are increasingly coming together in new ways, and thereby creating gradually a security network that's inclusive and principled. And more and more every day, we in the United States are finding more and more every day that nations in the Asia Pacific see future opportunities to improve their militaries and their security, and they're increasingly coming to us to partner. And we also find more and more that they have concerns about the future, about aggression and coercion, terrorism, transnational threats, even natural disasters. And once again, we experience a growing demand for American posture an American partnership. Meeting this demand and fueling this vision is the other big part of the third phase of the rebalance. The result is the steady growth of a principled and, and inclusive security network. It's grounded in principles like freedom of navigation and overflight that our countries have collectively promoted and upheld for decades. And it's inclusive since any nation in any military, no matter its capability, budget, or experience, can contribute. Everyone gets a voice, and no one is excluded. 
By the way, that includes China and its military. And we hope China doesn't exclude itself. The principled and inclusive security network is not a formal alliance, nor is it an effort to contain or to isolate anyone. Rather, it's a way for the United States and all of our allies, partners, and friends, and others in the region to connect, to cooperate, and to contribute to regional security and uphold shared principles. And this network's been developing in, a, in several ways. First, trilateral mechanisms are bit bringing together trios of allies and partners that previously worked together only bilaterally. This may seem like a small thing, but if you know the history out here, it's not. For example, the U.S.-Japan Republic of Korea, two great allies of ours, with which we've worked for many decades, each individually, now willing to work together with us. That partnership helps us coordinate responses, for example, very importantly, to North Korean nuclear and missile provocations. For the first time, our three nations conducted, for the very first time, a trilateral ballistic missile defense exercise earlier this summer. Second, beyond their relationships with the, involving the United States, some, many countries within the Asia Pacific are coming together on their own and establishing bilateral and trilateral mechanisms. For example, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines recently agreed to coordinate to coordinated trilateral maritime patrols to, to counter piracy, organized crime, and terrorist activity in the Sulu Sea. This is a good thing on its own, but it's an, also an important step for this developing network in the region. And third, even more broadly, regional nations are developing a network multilateral regional security architecture from one end of the region to the other. As with, for ex as a central example, the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus. Tomorrow, as I mentioned, my ASEAN defense counterparts and I will gather in Hawaii to discuss regional challenges. This is the second such informal dialogue the United States has hosted. And we're going to reflect on our shared interests and principles and identify new ways to partner together to further realize them. And of course, every security network needs networkers, nations, peoples, and militaries to enable it. So even as we respond to these five challenges I talked about earlier, all around the world, which only the United States has the strength to do, the U.S. Defense Department is Pacific's principled and inclusive security network to help their militaries do more with us together on our own. So we'll play our part, including in some specific ways. American personnel postured throughout the region, in Australia, on Guam, and elsewhere, will deploy more often to operate with both their American colleagues and their regional counterparts. That'll help solidify military-to-military -military relationships, strengthen security, and enhance deterrence. These deployments and our investments will also improve interoperability so that our militaries can work with and off the same platforms. And the exercises we've held for years and intensified in phase two of the rebalances are growing more complex and more frequent, and we're going to supply the resources to make it so. DOD also appreciates that many of our U.S. government partners, other parts of the government, have their own rebalance initiatives and each offers new opportunities to work together in this vital region. So, for example, we're increasing the Coast Guard's engagement with our State Department weaving together its security assistance programs in the Asia Pacific so that we can boost the capabilities of our allies and partners in the network while making them more interoperable. All of these efforts demonstrate how DOD will continue to pursue on our own and with our partners at home and in the region, new ways to ensure security in the Asia-Pacific. One possibility is in cyber. Because the network is so rich with nations with cyber expertise, including Japan, Korea, India, and Singapore, as each of our countries develop their cyber capabilities, we can learn from each other and cooperate together in this important domain. In total, the third phase of the balance and the inclusive security network. All of you ensure regional security and uphold principles in the years ahead. For example, after a future typhoon, we may see Australian P-8 with Singaporean personnel aboard with an American destroyer in search and rescue operations. 
navigation may also be upheld in part by joint and network patrols as network navies and air forces fly, sail, and operate together everywhere that international law allows to ensure the region's waterways remain safe and open. And of course, and this is what I want to conclude with, the key to all of this, to the third phase of the rebalance, is all of you. You and your fellow soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines will solidify the rebounds, and you will make this network work. And you will help the Asia-Pacific, once again, the single most consequential region for America's future, realize a principled and peaceful and prosperous future and play the role that only America can play. You'll do, the, you'll do so with strength as part of the finest fighting force the world has ever known. There's no one stronger, no one more capable, no one more innovative, because our military edge is second to none. And it will be, it will be so as far into the future as I can see. Because through our rebalance the Asia Pacific, we're making investments to ensure you stay the best and the United States remains the region's strongest military. You'll do so with commitment and the commitment of the entire Defense Department and the entire nation at your backs. Each part, economic, political, and military, in each phase of the rebalance has been a commitment to realizing the principled future. As you carry out the rebalance's third phase, you're not only answering your nation's call and ensuring the United States meets this commitment, you're also meeting the call of our regional allies and partners. Most important, you'll do it all with principle. That's who we are as a country, and it's who you are as a military. You're our best networkers. You're why we have so many friends in the region. Think about that. Who else has as many friends and partners? It's not an accident. You're skilled and capable but you embody the principles of many in the Asia Pacific already to rise and prosper, inspiring, cooperating, including, representing the principles that others value, other people want, and working with our allies and partners to ensure a better world. That reputation of yours makes me proud. With your strength, commitment and inclusion and your contributions to the rebalance's third phase, you're going on a pretty rich heritage, one past serve on the Vincent here. And those who served in the Asia Pacific in World War II, those of the post-9-11 era. And from those who've worked on the rebalance's first and second phases to those who will execute its third phase, future phases. In this, you will help realize the prayer that MacArthur spoke 71 years ago this month. You will help preserve peace, stability, and progress. And in so doing, you'll keep our country safe. You'll ensure the Asia Pacific remains a region where everyone can rise and prosper. Thank you. Keep it up. The country is behind you. I'm 100% 